at this time, I'd like to introduce our speaker today who has uh, specifically asked that we set this up as a Q&A discussion. So um, as we go along today, at any time, please unmute yourself and ask uh, your questions as we go along. Um, but our speaker today is an expert MC the former district governor for Rotary District 6560, an educator, and most recently founder of the Basham Group. Uh, so Dale Basham, I'm gonna turn it over to you and uh, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Ryan. It's so good to be with all of you. Mitchell, I just want you to know that I was born and raised in Louisville and I'm envious of you coming from Louisville. I haven't <laughs> been back for about a month. Um, my parents are 88 and 90 years old. They still live in their home on the, um, on the south side of Louisville. And um, uh, I hope to get to see them um, in, in a couple of weeks. They still drive around um, and uh, uh, have dinner every night. They do drive through. I'm gonna tell you a great little story. My, my dad is our song leader um, and my mother is the pianist at our church in Louisville. And the churches were all closed down, of course, during, uh, during the pandemic. And they decided that they, it was so much a part of their habit that got up every Sunday morning, had breakfast, got dressed up, um, let themselves into the church. They were the only two people there. My mom played the piano. My father led some songs and they had their worship right there in uh, at Wood Street Wesleyan Church over by University of Louisville. Um, so they're still going strong and um, I'm happy to say so am I. Good to be with you in Indiana. Um, I, as Ryan indicated uh, for many years, I was an educator with the Muncie Community Schools Actually, about 35 years, I was an educator. For the first 15 or 16 of those years, I was an English speech and theater teacher. Um, and I often uh, was amazed at the kind of progress my speech students made in one semester. Every day I would go into class and I was reminded of the, a great interview I saw with Jerry Seinfeld. Cindy, you may know uh, about this interview because Jerry Seinfeld, um, who I just love for his television show, but before he was a television star, sat down for an interview and said uh, that um, he, he had seen studies that show that people's number one fear in life is public speaking. Uh, and their number two fear is death. Now think about that for a minute. People are more afraid of being in front of an audience and speaking than they are of dying. So I guess that tells you that you'd, if you're, if you're headed to a funeral, you'd be better off being the person in the coffin than doing the eulogy. It never made sense to me, however, every time I looked into my classroom full of students for the first time, I saw, I, I, I got that. And they were so afraid of being in front of their students. And yet by the end of that class, they were so remarkably different. They were confident. They um, had uh, gained some skills with practice and coaching. And um, over the years, I have often reminded myself that Dale, you were probably your best student. You sat there for, you stood there for 15 years and you taught people how to be, be better communicators. And so as I go out and I talk to audiences, um, it's not so much that I'm interested in uh, giving you all of the details that I shared with all of my students uh, throughout a semester or two, but I think there are some really great tips that I can share with business leaders, educators, men and women who really want an edge 
in their life, whether they're um, whether they own a business, whether they're Rotarians, Kiwanians, where they're members of Open in Indiana, wanting the best for their uh, for for their customers. Um, I think you can. Uh, with these few tips, le uh, lose your fear of being in front of an audience. You can help organize your thoughts so that you can have an edge over your competitors. You can also learn to read your audience and uh, determine whether or not you're making, a, you're communicating. After all, communication is not just saying things, it's having things heard. So, um, and just remember that it's, it's about people receiving what it is you're, you're delivering. And finally, um, I think it's important that we all learn to, um, well, we all learn, we all learn to have people buy what they're selling. Preachers are selling a product. Um, uh, teachers are selling a product. Um, you all are selling a product to a, an audience. And even though Zoom has changed things a lot for all of us, eventually we're going to go back and we're going to have live audiences. Um, so what I, I would advise you, number one, one of my first tips is to learn your audience because every audience is different. And um, if you do a little bit of ho homework to find out the people in your audience to have a little bit of information about who's going to be there. You have an edge when you go in and you speak to them. Um, I um, would do my homework as district governor every time I went to a meeting in a different town or city. I would always research that Rotary Club. And in fact, my whole presentation was about the work they were doing. When your customers or your students know that you have done a little bit of research and you know a little bit about them, they're really impressed and they really um, are thankful that you considered them important enough to think about them before you ever got to the stage or to the Zoom lounge. So know your audience, that's tip number one. Always organize your thoughts. Here's another tip, organize your thoughts. If you have a three to five minute presentation or a 15 minute presentation, organize it so you have a short introduction that usually consists of an attention getter that might include, oh, um, may, maybe some personal reference or a story. An attention getter might also be a, a humorous introduction, not just a stupid joke, but a humorous introduction that might have something to do with the topic you're about to uh, talk about. Maybe a quotation, an important quote. You notice in the beginning, I talked about Jerry Seinfeld and his quote about uh, people being so afraid of speaking in, uh, in, in public. Maybe a startling statement or even starting with a, rhetor a rhetorical question is a good way to open up a speech. Um, after, you, uh, after you give that attention getter, it's always good for you to let the audience know what it is you plan to do in this speech. And I call this a thesis statement, T-H-E-S-I-S, -S, a thesis statement. You're just telling your audience what it is you're going to do. Essentially, an introduction is telling your audience what you're going to do. The, uh, the body of your speech is doing it, and your conclusion of the speech is telling your audience what you've just done. Organize your remarks so that you're, um, you're being efficient with your audience's time, and uh, they're, they're organized just like you are. And then finally, in that introduction, the third part of an introduction is um, give them a preview of the main points. I often told my students to prepare your speeches on note cards so that you could stand at a podium or a lectern and you could have your note cards and move about freely and you could move them um, uh, rather than shuffling papers. So putting your speeches 
on note cards, I think is an advantage over an eight and a half by 11 um, uh, a text. Um, so your body of your speech is maybe two or three main topics and you develop those main topics in your body. And then finally, the third part of a speech is always a conclusion. And you can go back to remove, uh, uh, review your main points in that conclusion. And finally, you can return to another closing statement that might be much like you started with a quote or a humorous story or some reason to engage their attention. You're wrapping it up with, uh, with a three-part organization of a speech that would include an introduction, a body, and a conclusion. I often would work with my students to do some other things that could overcome barriers to, um, to, to good learning or good listening. One of those barriers is to break the habit of space fillers. There would be a time in uh, the early days uh, with my students that students would pepper their speeches with um, um, space fillers, I called them. And over the course <laughs> of the semester, they would tap their pencils every time somebody in our class would do a space filler. I can't tell you the number of times that I run into students even today, leaders in the community who were in my speech class and they took something away that turned them into great leaders in their community. And they will always say, oh, Mr. Basham, I can't tell you how many times I count space fillers. I count us. I, um, I recognize when people have uh, eye contact or when they're, when they're not doing some of the things you told us to do. Of all the classes I taught in high school or college, that speech communication class is the class that most people remember because I think it's a class that is most transformative in people. Avoid, uh, avoid space fillers. Always recognize the importance of eye contact. Ryan, I was in a Rotary Zoom meeting with a very well-known Rotarian just two or three days ago. He read his entire message to us on Zoom, but he read it to us word for word. He did not look up until the speech was over and he missed the fact that so many of the audience completely tuned him out. Eye contact is so crucial. It's easier for me to achieve eye contact if I have my work, my outline, my notes on cards, and I can move those cards from front to back easily, and I'm at a standing mic rather than a handheld mic. Mm -hmm. I often find that a handheld mic forces you to pay attention to holding on to the microphone and you can't pay attention to your audience and, uh, and know whether or not they're listening or receiving what it is you're give, giving them. So eye contact is key. Another suggestion, a tip is to Know your topic well enough that you can give meaningful hand gestures. Um, so many speakers are so frightened, they're reading their speech in front of you and they're petrified by the occasion. They never lift their arms, they never engage their audience physically. And so they miss uh, they miss so much out of that speech. I used to tell my students and still do that 93% of communication is nonverbal. What is nonverbal? Mm -hmm. A nonverbal communication is your appearance. You're dressed for success, your hair, your accessories, whether or not you have good posture, eye contact, meaningful gestures. Keep in mind that studies show that 93% of, 
of the communication. The successful communication you have with your audience is through nonverbal communication, not with words, but all of those things that people, those cues that audiences pick up on that we might think they're just ignoring. And believe me, it's more intense on Zoom because you know what? This Zoom is being recorded. They're gonna go back and they can play it back and check out the good parts and laugh at the bad parts. So be prepared with the nonverbal cues. Again, that includes dress, your hair, accessories, posture, um, eye contact, and, uh, and, um, and, and meaningful gestures. Now, don't feel like you have to flail your arms about uh, constantly because that's annoying. But if you have gestures that, that reinforce the words that you are saying, those are, are really good nonverbal cues to uh, enhance your communication. Often, a part of communication that is ignored by speech teachers or communicators is listening. I read a survey one time that 75% of what we hear, we miss because we're not good listeners. Um, how shocking that is. Think of the thousands, yay, millions of dollars students spend on college classes. And what are we doing most of the time? We're sitting in an audience listening or pretending to listen. It's important that we recognize that maybe 40 to 80% of our salaries are earned by being good or bad listeners. How often do you, have you even heard of the concept of studying or working on listening skills? Rarely. And yet it's such a crucial part of the communication process. Remember, communication is not just in saying things, but in receiving things. <clears throat> Um, there are barriers to good listening. Sometimes we're distracted by um, outside noises. Um, sometimes we're bored. And so we daydream. We, uh, we check our social media. We're checking emails. Um, we're just not listening effectively. As businessmen and women, as, uh, as people who are interested in in communicating and giving our audience what it is they need or they say they want, it's really important that we develop that we develop good listening skills. One other one other tip that I always give my audiences about good communication is um, arrive early. I I will never forget those mornings or afternoons or evenings that I presented in Rotary Clubs really all over the world. And every time I arrived early, I don't care if that, if that meeting started at 7 a.m., I arrived at 6 so I could be set up. There was one club, and I'm not going to mention that club, I called earlier in the, early in the, um, uh, the week and I said, well, um, do you all have a, um, a screen or a projector? Uh, because I took a PowerPoint with me. No, nope, we don't have a PowerPoint, uh, PowerPoint projector, nor do we have a screen. Um, well, do you have a laptop? Well, no, we don't have a laptop either. Uh, well, do you have a blank wall that I could put? No, we don't have that either. And so luckily I had a trunk full of all of my own equipment. I was prepared once I arrived and uh, just, uh, just in case he was telling me the truth, which he was, I took a white blanket that I duct tape over a window and I had a PowerPoint screen for my presentation. You probably noticed this morning, I don't have PowerPoint. Um, when you can be in total control of the event, go for it. PowerPoint is a great enhancement to whatever it is you're saying to an audience. 
But if you don't have control, a, a, a PowerPoint that is not ready or not uh, uh, appropriately formatted to the projector or laptop can be nothing but chaos. And it makes you as the speaker look unprepared. So on Zoom, I typically do not use a PowerPoint because so many levels of expertise and technology will greet us. And so PowerPoint just doesn't seem to um, work as well as being early and being prepared with, um, um, with uh, maybe some powerful tips for my audience. You know, the Zoom lounge has, has really created a lot of challenges for communicators. Eventually, we're going to go live again, but Zoom is available, especially on days like this, and we can take advantage of not having to go out in the ice and sleet. Uh, but Zoom also has a few uh, challenges that I think we need to be aware of. Um, and I'm sure you already are, but again, be, be, one tip is to be ready for technology, call ahead and make sure that the moderator of your meeting is ready for your Zoom. Also, um, make sure that they are ready for um, both Apple and PC, no matter what programs you're starting with, they need to know that ahead of time if you're using a PowerPoint. Again, everybody knows mute, when you're not speaking, um, stay alert on camera. I often see uh, in the Zoom lounge that people are completely somewhere else. Now we have that, that uh, luxury of being able to go to our names on a screen or to a picture on a screen. But if you're there on a screen, let, let your speaker and the others know that you're really interested. And, um, and if you're not, they will know, um, just like I did in class. When I would see a kid was talking or handing out notes or doing something, I was able to stand in front of that class and correct that situation right then and there. As adults, it's probably not so cool to say, hey, you in the center square, I see you over there knitting, not paying any attention to me. Uh, <laughs> so I probably won't do that, but it's, uh, again, it's listening and, and presenting. It's, it's a two-way communication that you need to be aware of. I have a pet peeve, whether you're live or in Zoom, and all of us are guilty of it but I believe acronyms are from Satan. Acronyms, we use acronyms all the time. Acronyms are an insider's language to keep the outsiders from knowing what we're talking about. Go ahead and say the words so that you're thoroughly communicating with your audience. You can say the acronym later if you've already identified the words but don't start off with acronyms without defining them. One of, my, uh, uh, one of my job promotions was as director of the Muncie Area Career Center. And career and technical education along with adult education, they live on acronyms. I, I had no idea what people were talking about. I was from traditional education all of my many years as an educator, and I landed in this, this wonderful location, and everybody was going to school just like always, but they were speaking in a foreign language that was mostly acronyms. Um, I had a wonderful uh, um, administrative assistant who did cheat sheets for me, and, and I was able to kind of follow along with the cheat sheets, but you know, to avoid that miscommunication, try to avoid acronyms when you don't have to use them. And also to my, my fellow Zoom lounge members, um, pay attention to lighting and backgrounds. Um, that's, uh, that's a, that's a special thing going on right now. Lighting and backgrounds are crucial to a good Zoom lounge. If you would like to know more about getting more experience in front of an audience, I would suggest that you connect with Toastmasters 
www.ghostbusters.org, practically every town or city has a Toastmasters. Um, Rotary International has partnered for the first time ever with Toastmasters International, and we advocate our members gain experience being in front of an audience by joining a Toastmasters. And Ryan, Ryan it might be good for you to invite um, a local uh, Toastmasters leader to open in Indiana just to give uh, some more tips about speaking and communicating in public. If you'd like to reach out to me, um, I'm on Facebook. Um, I am Dale Basham on Facebook, or I also have the Basham Group on Facebook. On Instagram, I'm dbasham5, and I'm also the Basham Group on Instagram. And my email address is dbasham5 at comcast.net. That's dbasham5 at comcast.net. Just remember, communication is consists of not just saying things, but in having them heard. How about questions? I have a comment or comment or two. Um, I appreciate the very first thing you said, learn your audience. Um, with what I do with Culligan Water, it's very important that I notice that they have cases of water, bottled water in their garage as I'm going in their garage or that they have, um, you know, bags of salt or the guy's, you know, um, got some back problems and he needs his, his salt delivered. Um, know your audience. I try to look up people sometimes before I go to their home yeah. um, and understand, um, you know, if we have friends in common and so on. So it's very important for that. I agree. And number two, acronyms. It's a pet peeve of mine. I do it a lot because, you know, we know what we know and we do what we do and we think that other people know what we're talking about. But my big one is RO. We talk about ROs all the time. People go, customers go, a what? And I, I go, I'm sorry, I'm not supposed to say that. It's a reverse osmosis unit. Um, so I appreciate the reminders and I, I totally agree with you. Thank you for that. That was very good. Good reminders. Great. Dale, I too <laughs> abhor the space fillers was in a meeting one day and had a woman presenting and it was, I think she was presenting on insurance. And I started counting the ums. In less than 10 minutes, she said um over a hundred times. And at that point, I wasn't paying attention to what she was talking about because I was so distracted by her lack of decent presentation. So that's that's another thing. And, and the a couple of the uh, acronyms I'm guilty of within the tax world, there's a qualified business income deduction that all small business owners receive on their tax return. And I forget, and I talk about QBI, and I get this blank look. <laughs> Even when I've explained it to groups before, I still get a blank look. Yeah. <laughs> really, I, I really believe that. It's, a, it's an <laughs> It's an insider's language to keep the outsiders from knowing what you're talking about. That might not be the intention, but in Rotary, it happens all the time. And I used to call people out, whether they were in front of an audience or next to me, I would just call them out, raise my hand. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. um, and they got it. Oh, they got it eventually. But, you know, as soon as I left the room, they started talking in acronyms again. <laughs> and Dale, do you Hi, have Dale, another? Just done yet. I'm sorry. Okay, do I have the floor? Okay, I'll go ahead. <laughs> um, well, very, very, very nice, great, informative presentation. 
Okay, I took a lot of notes. Oh, um, I, I did take myself off the screen though, and I wanted to share this with you is because I use the internet from my phone, so I get better signal, yes, when uh, I'm not using the, the screen. But the one thing I've learned over the years, uh, even in my network marketing slash sales, because practically that's what it is, is listening. I had to enhance my listening skills because I have the, um, I, I just like to talk, okay? So I don't know if I talk a lot because I like to listen to myself a lot, okay? But I also call it like the gift to gap. So I did have to learn how to listen more. And um, I'll never forget, I was listening to a presentation where the um, speaker used the term vomit on people. And I go like, oh my goodness, that's me. I just vomit all over people. <laughs> I need to start listening more. So thank you very much uh, for that presentation. Yes, and I was born in Louisville, Kentucky. I want to share that with you. Oh. Yes. Uh-huh. <laughs> On the west side. Yes. Where'd you go to school? John Foster. Okay. Yes, right off of Garland Avenue. Yeah. That 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 those years actually impact my life. If people were to ask me what do I remember most about my elementary years, it would be John Foster, fourth grade, Mrs. Evans as my teacher. Awesome. Jennifer, I believe you were you also had a question for Dale. I just didn't know if Dale had a, a number, a phone number. He didn't put it in the chat. Yes. My number is 765-749-4444. Or you can reach me by email at dbasham5 at comcast.net. Thank you. My niece is actually a horse trainer right outside of Louisville. Oh, really? Yeah. Mornington Farms. Anyway, small world. Love it. Yes, it is. <laughs> How far are you from uh, Louisville, Dale? How far are you? How far do you live from Louisville? You said your your parents lived there. Yes, How actually. Long I, well, I'm in Muncie, Indiana. Small town. I don't know exactly where that is. Is it close to Indy or? Uh, yes, it's um it's north um east of Indianapolis, about forty miles northeast, home of Ball State University. Mm -hmm. Okay, gotcha. I know the university. I have some family. Not family, but some old friends that used to live in my neighborhood here in Louisville that live in Noblesville, Indiana now. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Close to you. Yeah. So what part of Louisville do you live in, Mitch? Mitchell? I live in J-Town. I live in the east kind of end side of Louisville. Yeah. -Town. Yeah. Well, I went to Pleasure Ridge Park High School. Okay. Yeah. That's, uh, that's on the other side. It's probably about 35, 40 minute drive for me. Yes. Okay. Um, but I know which, I've been there a few times though. I played basketball as well. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Where'd you where did you play basketball? At Eastern. Oh yeah. 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 So uh, we often played Eastern. Yeah, no, we played uh we played PRP when I was there in the King of the Bluegrass one year in the first round, I think. And they beat Yeah, us. okay. But we play PRP every year. So um yeah, good times. Good okay. times. But I've been there as a high school basketball official too. I do that now in Louisville, so. Excellent. So that's fun. That keeps me busy as well on the side. <laughs> so nice to meet you and a fellow Kentuckian. Yes, sir. <laughs> nice to meet you too, Dale. Uh, I think I might have added you on LinkedIn just recently, so. Um, Great. I can't be with you on there, so. Yes, absolutely. Do. Great talking with you. Awesome. Does anyone have any other questions for Dale? All right. Well, let's give Dale a big hand for his presentation today. 
Uh, so since it's uh, three till, uh, we only have a couple of minutes. I'd like to give everyone an opportunity to share any events or announcements that they have. Any announcements, events? We're doing a, um, a webinar for um, 2021, sort of looking forward for that. So if anybody's interested, it's a gathering. I'm trying to do webinars for my clients and our home office has put together um, professionals from um, different fields as well as ours um, to speak on that. So we do have a looking forward at 2021 webinar on the 28th. It's about three o'clock, but if you register for it, you can actually go back and, and watch the recording um, if that doesn't coincide with a time that you have free. So it's listed on my website as well, if you're interested. Awesome. And Jennifer, can you drop the link to register for that into the chat? Yep. Awesome, thank you. Brian, Cindy is a Toastmaster and she actually got an award at the end of the year from Toastmasters. So she might be a good one to do something on communications as well. Absolutely, good point, Jeanette. This is Sharon, hi everybody. Um, I have a second hi, Saturday hi, coming up February 13th where I'm offering uh, short sessions on the wiggly waves therapy that I do and it's pay what you can. And I put the link, you can link to the calendar and register via my website, which I just put in the link. And if you or somebody you know that would like to have it, you can have either a 15 minute session or a half hour session. It's really great for relaxing. And if you have some specific issue, like my knee always hurts or my hip always hurts, my back or my shoulder, then that 15 minutes can do a lot for that mm -hmm. particular mm -hmm. issue. Thank you. Awesome, thank you, Sharon. Any other events, announcements? Um, I think I need to get more information about this, but at the end of the month, there is a, the Rap Snacks Foundation is doing a virtual summit for about for two weekends in a row. Um, they'll be promoting financial literacy, entrepreneurship and everything. And uh, I think, uh, I think I'll be speaking once or twice. So if anyone is interested, as I get closer to those dates, I'll send more information. Awesome. Well, a uh, quick reminder that next week's speaker on this meeting, uh, February 1st, is going to be Sharon Schweitzer to talk about how to relieve pain without drugs. And Sharon, I made sure we went back and corrected that so no one is reliving their pain. Uh, so uh, simple, spelling, simple spelling errors really make a difference here. Uh, and then uh, coming up two weeks from today, February 8th, we have Adeniki McKinday, who's going to talk about how to promote your purpose in your business. Uh, and then February 15th, we have Gina Covarubius, uh, who's going to talk about I'm <clears throat> feeling anxious about the unknown future. And uh, finally, on February 22nd, Marianne Whitebrock, uh, who is the owner of Cardinal Elements, is going to talk about American Heart Month, uh, since February is American Heart Month. So it is 1231 now, so we'll go ahead and wrap it up for today unless anyone has anything else they'd like to add. Um, so I'd like to wish everyone a safe, happy, and productive week and uh, join us again next Monday. <laughs>